David, you're so right about this because I meet like hundreds of attorneys a week. And the first thing I do is to go to check their bio. And it is, it is so cookie cutter that it takes me like two seconds to read the bio because it says, I went to school here, graduated there, got my license then, and I'm practicing everything. And it's like, okay. It's like, yeah. there's nothing else. It's almost like reading a business card that says, my name is John Smith. This is my phone and email. We're good. We're done. It's, uh, yeah. There's no connection. There's no personality. There's no branding, nothing. Yes. And, and if you're old enough to remember the old head and shoulders commercial, it was, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So you want to make a great first impression. And that's where bio LinkedIn places like that are powerful. Okay. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today on our new podcast. The topic of the podcast is scaling your law firm. And I know a lot of people have been very interested to find out the variety of different methods of scaling your law firm. So we'll start now. My name is Hamid Khan. I'm the president and CEO of LegalSoft. My basic background, spent 20 years in Silicon Valley in early dot-com eras and managed and ran several different high-tech companies. And then later on switched into the legal sector. And since then we've been growing LegalSoft with a variety of different services and programs. We work with over a thousand law firms nationwide, a variety of different practice types. And we've been able to help a lot of law firms to scale their practices, not only within the state or within that practice, also nationwide. I also have uh, published several books that help the uh, law firms to scale their practice in a variety of different ways. In the end of this presentation, we will definitely provide you the link to be able to obtain those books, or we can actually send it to you, or you can uh, directly get those books on your own. So we have David Friedman, who is also my co-host on this podcast. Go ahead, David. All right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, really glad to be here. It's going to be Really interesting to talk about how to help your bottom line and your top line at the same time so you can scale up to the numbers that you've dreamed of. I'm on this. I've had experience where I was a lawyer, formerly practiced in New York. I've had the honor of being recognized as the number one business development coach and consultant in the United States for three consecutive years. Got me into the National Law Journal Hall of Fame for what that's worth. Uh, but we'll talk about brand and those are good things for a brand. And then also I've created a program called Lawyer Book Builder, which is basically the compilation of everything that I've done training over 10,000 lawyers in my career, and I put it into an online program. So going forward, we're going to share with you the wisdom that we've collected over our years of experience of doing this. Hamid, let me hand it All back right, to you. Thank you, David. So this is our agenda today. We're going to start with the introduction that we did about ourselves. And the next thing is a virtual legal staffing that I'm going to talk about. It's been a very hot topic in a variety of different conferences and medias and so forth. I understand that even in some of the law schools now they're teaching about the virtual staffing within the law firms, which is uh, very insightful. So what is a virtual legal staff? Essentially, when I was also doing consulting and scaling and coaching within the law firms, the one and number one challenge of a scaling a firm was always a staffing. Every time I asked why we don't get more cases, why we don't do the cases faster, why is our intake process uh, con not converting the way it should, it always came down to we can't find the right people, we can't keep the people, everybody's multitasking. So the number one reason for not scaling was a staffing. So at that point is when I started looking at globally where is the talent everywhere else? And we compartmentalize the, the law practice into a variety of different sections from intake to case management to document collections and so forth. And that's where the concept of the legal ritual staffing came about. So uh, we begin by recruiting, training, and placing and managing virtual legal staff from a variety of different countries which we have physical offices in eight different countries, and was able to grow the law firm by placing dedicated bilingual intake staff so they don't have to worry about that challenge. 
and then later on how to expedite managing a case by providing legal staff to the case management side, which they can do, like in the case of personal injury, they can actually provide the treatment, schedule the treatments, filing and collecting the police reports, the insurance policies and everything. So that was one of the most significant achievement that we did by streamlining the intake process uh, and also the legal process. So now within the firms that are using these services, now they have dedicated, inexpensive uh, intake staff, case managers, junior case managers, people who do medical record or employment record retrievals, and they all train within the process of the legal term terminologies, and also train by using the CSMs that each law firms use, you know, things like FileWine, Clio, Lidify, and so forth. So they come prepared being able to do those tasks. Now, what is, has changed in the uh, from the traditional structure, we actually have, we develop org charts right in the beginning with the law firm to identify the potential areas where the firm can actually utilize a virtual staff versus local staff. By the way, the cost saving in that is about one to four. So for a, for a cost of one local staff, you can actually have four full-time staff that they work within the hours that the, the operation works or off hours. In the case of the intake, it was very changed where the challenge was, when I'm telling the attorneys, they need to be available to, we, to talk to the client at any time. They're like, no, I work eight to five and I don't work on the weekends and so forth. The virtual staff work in any schedule of hours that the firm needs it, at evenings, on the weekends, on the holidays, so that changes a lot about the operation of the practice. The practice is basically now is open 24-7, you know, seven days a week, instead of just doing a nine to five traditional. So that was a big change within the firm. So what are some of those positions? You got intake staff, uh, again, bilingual, full-time, dedicated, junior case managers, legal assistants, paralegals, and we have gone this last year as far as going and getting remote attorneys. That's That was a very interesting uh, setup where we recruit attorneys in many different countries who have actually gone to law school. A lot of them gone to law school based on the English as a language anyway. And they passed the bar within the country and they are practicing or have practiced in the past. So we recruit these folks and we place them into the law firms in the U.S., both on pre lead and lead which they work with the attorneys as their assistant. So they work as a paralegal or something that the law clerk or associate would do. And they can write motions, they can write appeals, they can do discoveries, they write demands, variety of different tasks. And that's probably been one of the uh, second most successful position from the legal staff that we place. And honestly, we can't keep enough of them in the inventory to pass on to the law firms. So uh, scaling a law firm with virtual staffing, you streamlining your process, you're reducing your cost uh, <clears throat> of operation, and now you have much wider range of services you can provide during the time that you're basically open for business. Uh, and is scalable. So uh, we have law firms who have over 40 virtual staff placed in the firm because they have removed that challenge from scaling the firm. It's not like, oh, I wish I could have five more case managers that I could recruit, hire, and afford. Now they sort of call legal staff and say, look guys, we need five more of these and three more of that, and we want them in, in, in a week. And we fulfill those uh, requirements. And on the other hand, with all the changes in employment law, the firm doesn't have any liabilities as far as the employee employer liabilities, paying taxes, paying benefits. Termination is very difficult in some states like in California. So all they have to do, because it's their 1099 from us to, to the firm, they can just call us, replace the person, add the person, terminate the person, no liability, 
no red tape, no issues. There is no long-term commitments on the contracts. So it sort of relieves the firm from, oh my God, I would love to have five more people, but all these challenges needs to be met. So we help them scale with that process. So the cost effectiveness of it, some, most of these uh, positions it starts at like $2,000 a month for a full-time person, fully loaded. Again, we provide this virtual staff the benefits. So we pay them the pay increases from our end. We provide them with high-speed internet, computers. We even go as far as providing them health insurance and retirement accounts because we want these folks to stay around and advance within the firm. So the cost effectiveness is very huge for the firm because they don't have to worry about any part of that. Um, so for anybody who is interested, you basically just start with one or two of these staff. You carve out, when I was doing the consulting for the firms, one of the first thing I said was like, okay, you as an attorney, you basically have a billable hours of $500 an hour, and then you find half of your day you're spending doing something that a 20 bucks an hour person can do. So how does that work? When at one minute your time was 500 and the next minute it was 20. Uh, so you need to sort of draw the line about what you do or what your paralegal or your other associates do and trying to focus on the highest value skill set that you have or your team have and trying to leverage that for your firm and farming out everything else to the virtual staff that we just talked about. Like one of the big things yesterday, we had a big celebration where we launched our first virtual law firm bookkeeper who knows how to manage trust account, operating account. Uh, they know how to do the P&Ls, cost allocations, uh, collection from the insurance companies. So here we go again, you get a full-time you know, bookkeeper who's trained for the law firm for less than $2,000 a month. And it's a full-time. So you can get them to do even your own, you know, personal checking or reconciling your credit cards and everything in between. So these are all the steps to streamline the operation and reduce the cost of the operation utilizing virtual staff. So we talked about the services. Uh, <clears throat> we provide full range of uh, virtual staffing. We also provide variety of different uh, scaling from on your social media and online presence. So is a sort of a full service law firm operation environment. The staffing was the biggest challenge. We achieved that with virtual staffing. On the practice management solution, we have a complete online presence uh, services, which is complete social media management. Uh, not like a typical social media management who they do variety of different disciplines and businesses and types that do anything from e-commerce to the insurance, to mortgage, to finance, to solar. We do specifically legal social media management. So we know what are the topics, what are the ch uh, changes in law, what our people are interested in. So our content is very engaging in a specific part of the law. Uh, and we do it per practice type. So our team is basically trained and aware of everything is going on with personal injury, employment, mass tort, all of those areas. So Hamid, let me just ask, are you saying that your team can actually produce the content? Absolutely. Produce wow. the content, edit, yeah. post, and engage in all social media platforms. So you're talking about Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn. We, do, we cover all of it. And we also go as far as sending videographers to each of the locations all over the country. We have a network of videographers that they actually go on site and create content on site with the attorney, with their clients for testimonials, with, with their team, to be able to create an online presence that is real and is not just a bunch of pictures and a bunch of verbiage, is actually video that videos that are created specifically for that firm. And then it goes on their website, we manage their website, so we post on their website, we post on their social media, we do the engagement, um, we put it into monthly newsletters that a company sends out in the behalf of the firm. 
So we do monthly newsletter that goes out. We do SMS marketing for them. I mean, it's a full blown services from website to social, to client retentions, referral programs, everything is covered in even review collections for Google reviews or any other kind of reviews. So it is everything is intended in the focus of a scaling. So we I accumulated the list of challenges that the firm has about scaling, and that's we created services to, to fix that those challenges. A staffing, um, when you're doing the social media or any kind of a online presence, it's tedious. But with the graphics, it's very uh, competitive. The messaging is very key to be engaging. So people are paying attention and actually looking at things. The videos, the distribution, we even boost some of the videos for them online so they can get a lot more traction from the content that we generate. And the content is utilized in a variety of different ways for the firm. You know, on, on one of the things I always mention it in my book and everywhere else, is the typical law firms had a tendency to always look for the next new client. So the whole focus is like, how can I get 10 more clients? One thing that they forget, and there's never been a systematic way around it, is that the, what happens to every single client that I served in the past five years, 10 years, 30 years, they seem like they take it for granted, all of these people are just gonna automatically come back to the firm when they have a case or they have family members or friends or colleagues. That's not the case. I always say, if you think about that, you're not gonna get any of them back really because by the, by the time they actually have a case and they wanna actually think about who you are, what was your contact information, what was your website, what was your name, they get hijacked like 10 times by social media, with the billboard, the radios and TVs. But, but while they're actually thinking who you were, that they worked with three years ago, they are already retained by some other firm. And now there's other four other firms also chasing them to retain them. So you can't count on that. You have to be proactive. You have to have a client retention program that you keeps you in full contact with everybody who you work with from day one. And that's achieved by a variety of different systems that we set up. One, active social media, so they see you on the pages and so forth. Two, regularly send out monthly newsletter from the firm to everybody in the contact list. Your new case that you just won or new members that you just added or new services you provide and variety of different ways to just be in front of your former client. Then we do SMS marketing. We're basically sending a text to everybody in your list saying that Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, a Happy Anniversary. It was three years from uh, uh, ago where I handed you that six-figure check. Congratulations. I hope you're doing well. You know, all of that, it just keeps you those people in your network and doesn't allow other firms to steal them, basically. So we have and, like... And, you know let me just add to that. There's a, a phrase that I heard that was something like, it's not their job to remember you. It's your job to stay unforgettable. And with the tools that you're suggesting, you know, you're, you're giving lawyers the tools to be able to make that happen. So that's great. Absolutely. They, absolutely. They forget, they, they forget David, that's absolutely, absolutely right. That's absolutely it's like, right. It's the, like the biggest, the, the biggest asset these firms have is their former clients. That's the goodwill of the practice. Otherwise, there's not much there except a bunch of computers and desks and the, and the office. And if you go to any other business, there's always the value of that business at that law firm is how many people you subscribe to you, how many people you served before, how many people you use in your network, your referral network and everything. It's just an asset. But unfortunately, because of the nature of the, the business, everybody is chasing the next new client and everybody forgetting about everything else. I have uh, law firms been practicing for 40 years. And when I told them, well, have you told them that you moved your location? He goes, how would I do that? Um, should I do that? Do I need to do that? <laughs> I'm like, 40 years of practice. You have served a lot of people and they should know everything about you and your practice on an ongoing basis. So yeah, no, they're not gonna search and send a search and rescue to find you so they can give you a, a case. It's not happening. 
so that's been the, the big part of this process. So now we talked about sort of we already save it into uh, the brand recognition, building a brand. Again, before 10, 15, 20 years ago, nobody really cared. If you told the attorney or the physician they need to build a brand, they're like, no, I'm not Amazon. I'm not, you know, Nike. So what do you mean I need to build a brand? Well, now everything is a brand. Even the law firm is a brand. So I segue into how you build a brand and how you manage the brand. So, I mean, this is just so fascinating to hear all the ways to be able to, to save costs and to shrink the, the staffing cost that's such a drain on firms. I'm going to talk about the other side and I'm going to talk more about how you do attract new work, stay in touch with existing clients and so on. And one of the first things that's so important is who are you? What is your brand? There are you know, tens of thousands of lawyers that you might be competing with. Why you? And so you want to take a look at this. So we go right back to the blackboard and go to the basics. First, you've got to tell your story. What makes you you? Why would someone want to choose you versus another lawyer? So maybe you have certain technical skills that stand out. And that's great. It also could be the history of what you've done in your life because certain people like to relate to certain people that have a certain kind of a background. Maybe there are things that you've done in your life that people relate to. So I often see in bios, and we'll talk about bios in a moment, you know, that section that usually that last paragraph that gives a little bit of a story of the personal life so that you're telling more about who you are as a person. So you've got to get your story out there and especially with some of the tools that Hamid is talking about. Then you've got to find the right people. I often find lawyers who will go to bar association meetings because they think they're doing business development, but that's not the crowd that would send them work. So you've got to make sure that you're reaching the right people that can be either potential clients, potential referral sources, or what I call amplifiers, people that could get you speaking engagements and get you written up in good publications. So you've got to find the right people. And then You've got to do it over and over and over again, because again, just as Hamid said, people are going to forget about you. There is so much noise out there. There are so many people trying to grab the attention of the right audiences that you have to stay visible. And what I love that Hamid has is a team of people that know how to do it in a way that can stand out and be different because they're knowledgeable in this area. So let's talk about bios for a second, because bios are the first audition that often lawyers go through. And you see here, my title is The Battle of the Bios. And maybe your bio falls into this category, but and I've trained and coached well over 10,000 lawyers in my career. I've looked at a lot of lawyer bios, and most of them, you could take the name out, put another person's name in, and you would never know the difference. So if a bio is the first audition, you've got to make it pop. It's got to stand out. So here are some of the elements you may want to look at when you're creating a great bio. First. Sometimes we see the, the shovel approach. Let me throw every kind of practice that I would hope somebody might hire me for, and I just throw it on a page. Instead, put priorities. If you really want to say, you know what, what is the most profitable, the most enjoyable, whatever your factors are, put it first. This way, this is the way people look at it. They prioritize in their reading what is most important, so give it to them in that order. Also, that first sentence, the first paragraph, just like the opening of a book, or you know, if you're looking at a newspaper article, it's like the law of journalism is you want to create a great title and a great first sentence so that people will want to continue reading. So have a good, compelling opening that would make people go, huh, all right, I want to read more. It may take a little work, but think through how to do that. Also, you may want to give some examples of what it's like to work for you. Now, in most jurisdictions, you can't have client quotes and so on, but there are ways to do this. For example, it might be, you know, clients have said that working with David is like, and then you give an example. And then you can give, you know, other stories, especially in your personality part, maybe that last paragraph, give some examples of some of the things you do that might build upon attributes. So for intellectual property lawyers, sometimes they will put in things about how they just, as a child, loved tinkering with electronics and took apart the TV and put it back together again. I mean, these are little things that give people insight into the kind of person you are. 
And I'm sure you've seen bios. Most of them do not tell a good story. And this is your chance to tell your story. Also, throw a little personality in. Uh, you know, I know a lot of lawyers who, when they talk about what their strengths are, they talk about, well, I'm a very good writer. Well, you're not showing it here on the bio. <laughs> Why don't you do a little audition for your writing skills on the bio? So show a little personality in there. And then what's really important is to share a story or two of clients where you've been successful. Because if I'm a prospective client and I'm looking at your bio, I want to know that you've done things that are similar to what I'm looking for. So there's a process here. Tell what the problem was, then what your solution was, and then what the great outcome was. That's a great little formula, problem, solution, and outcome. And then also, you know, with a team like Hamid's, they can look at your bio and your website and try to find the keywords that are very important so that the search engines will pick you up. So they, you could be up higher when people are looking for people like you. Uh, David, you're so right about this because I meet like hundreds of attorneys a week. And the first thing I do is to go to check their bio. And it is, it is so cookie cutter that it takes me like two seconds to read the bio because it says, I went to school here, graduated there, got my license then, and I'm practicing everything. And it's like, okay. It's like right. there's nothing else. It's almost like reading a business card that says, my name is John Smith. This is my phone and email. We're good. We're done. It's, uh, there's no connection. There's no personality. There's no branding, nothing. Yes. And, and if you're old enough to remember the old head and shoulders commercial, mm -hmm. it was you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So you want to make a great first impression. And that's where bio, LinkedIn, places like that are powerful. Absolutely. Now, I know, I mean, you know, when you talk about communicating your brand, there are some very effective ways of doing it. You can certainly see all the logos up there. If you want to take a second and just talk about some of the ways that you've seen that have worked, that would be great. Have on that screen is, is just as effective because you have to do the entire thing to be effective because each of them attracts certain demographic and certain interests and so forth. So you can't really exclude anything out and say, oh, I do have an Instagram or I do have a Facebook. No, you need to have them all because it's all different demographics. And this is what we focus on to make sure that the content is distributed and leveraged in all platforms. We don't exclude anything. Say, oh, TikTok is not really my, uh, my demographic. It really is because everybody is on it at some point of time. And you need to be able to, like we recommend, or we do three posts a week, every week. And it has to be a variety of both professional and personal. So we make the, we make the connection from the personal level where you mentioned on your talk about how they need to be on the video. I used to tell them, look, just grab your cell phone and talk to it. Uh, so when people look at it, there's a personality, there's a connection. And then we also do some professional posts to mix it up. So it's not like, you know, I see some of those things that were the, the entire post is their personal life from pictures from the dogs to foods, to cars, to vacations. And it's like, it's great Ooh, sharing your life with us, but it needs to be mixed between professional and personal. It's interesting because something like, as you mentioned, TikTok, that's the platform that shows more of the human side, the personality side. Whereas a LinkedIn or something else is more of the professional and more of the gravitas side of it. And then I like to look at this from a different, another way of saying what you just said, which is ubiquity. Meaning like if I'm on Facebook, huh, I see Hamid. And then I'm on TikTok, huh, I see Hamid. And then I'm here and I'm here and I'm seeing him everywhere. It makes it look like you are just the best and the biggest in your industry. And so the more you can hit everybody everywhere, it makes you look like a top professional. And so, you know, there's lots of ways to be able to do this. And I think Hamid gave us some great examples of how to leverage the different platforms to get the visibility. I mean, one example, you know, it could be that there are a lot of, let's say there are referral sources that you do want to get from bar associations. They have the publications, they put on webinars, they need speakers. This is the way that you can get a group to do your marketing for you. They've already collected the hundreds, if not thousands of the people in the right audience. And then you can be the person who can be amplified by that. So there's lots of ways to be able to play this game.
All right, let's talk about this next piece. And Hamid talked a little bit about one of the networks, but this idea of building great networks, most lawyers don't really look at all the networks they have, and then they let a lot of them fall apart. So let's take a look at this. First, your internal network. If you're in a firm of any size and you've got a number of other lawyers, there's a bucket of people there that are part of your network. And so let's go one side, the other lawyers in the firm. Now, if you're in a larger firm, you can say there are lawyers in your own practice group. You know, these people often are people that need someone like you for more work. There are new lateral lawyers that come into the firm. They need new friends. <laughs> you can help them get comfortable and then build relationships with them. And there may be opportunities for them to serve your clients and you to serve their clients. If there are lawyers that you have in the firm and other practice groups, especially those that are complementary to yours then build those relationships. You can do marketing with these people to reach out to the audiences, both former clients, existing clients, referral sources, and so on. And then if you're in a large enough firm, if there are other offices, and I know some firms, you know, one firm I remember that they would pay for each partner to visit another office to spend three or four days at a time. Each year they'd have each partner do that so that they'd still be working but they'd be in the office. And then of course they encourage them to have breakfast and lunch and dinner with the lawyers to meet the lawyer's clients. And it was a great way to, to forth <laughs> getting these connections to happen. So we've got this internal network. Also, you've got your staff and the different professionals. And these are people that might have people in their network that need someone like you. And so to motivate them, to teach them how to tell your story, these are people that have power to bring in more work and we sometimes forget about them. Now, I often work with firms of all sizes, but when I work with the medium and large firms, they have people who are in the marketing and business development departments. And I jokingly say, what is their most important job for you? And they you know, come up with this and then I say, look, their most important job is to make you as wealthy as you wanna become. That's how they're measured on revenue. They know how to do it. They have the kind of tools that Hamid's talking about but most lawyers don't know how to do it. They don't think about using these assets. All right, now let's look outside and let's look at the external world. And so we've got our current clients. And of course, these are people who, if they are currently doing work with you, they might have more of the same kind of work depending on your practice. Then you've got this whole world of people that you have met at conferences, uh, when you're talking, when you're speaking, when you're on a webinar like this, people who have shown that they care about what you do. But most lawyers that I know do not have good follow-up systems. And I remember seeing a statistic that said that for professional service providers, two-thirds of the leads that they collect in their career, they don't follow up with. Think about the revenue you're losing because you don't have a system to grab and then to keep communicating to remind people you're out there. Then, as Hamid said, former clients. And we just can't let them forget about us because <clears throat> most probably they really liked working with you. The matter was over and they move on. So you've got to keep doing things to be reminding them that you're out there. Referral sources. A lot of you get work from other professionals. And yet, do you have a great system for finding them? And then once you have them to continue to nurture them, as Hamid said, over and over, remind them who you are so that you position yourself as one of the top people in your practice area in their minds. You have the power to do that if you have systems to do that. Friends and family. I mean, a lot of people have no idea what you do for a living. And I remember one joke, you know, someone said, yeah, friends and family, I hope never again to get work from friends and family because <laughs> they never want to pay and they're a big pain. But these are people who know a lot of other people. They can refer work to you. And so let them know what you do and communicate with them. The media, these are amplifiers. And you can get famous by getting in front of the right people who are always looking for content. If you are a good presenter, if you're a good writer, they need people like you. So remember, they start with a blank screen every day. <laughs> they need your content. Alumni. So if you're in a firm of any size and lawyers have left, sometimes we forget about them. You've gone to school 
These are people that we sometimes forget about over time. And so keep these people in the queue and keep reminding them that you're out there. Now, if we were live in the room, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been referred work by someone you were on the other side of. A lot of people do. And so to come up with ways to elegantly communicate with the other opposing lawyers or the other clients, if there's ways to do it, I, I've seen it so many times in my career where after a lawyer did some work, the client reached out afterwards and said, I loved how you were and I want to hire you going forward. So these are all networks that we don't think about. Also, most of you do something other than practicing law. So you might play tennis, you might be part of a running club, you might be in a book club, whatever. These are people who often don't really know what you do. So targeting the right kind of communication with them can elegantly remind them that you are a person who does this kind of work. And then the last one I have here is about organizations and boards. So some of you have been in organizations for years and years or you're on certain boards and you've been wishing that this person would give you work, but it hasn't happened. So, you know, having techniques for what I call the one-to-many being in an organization board to going one-to-one, -to, -one, to find a reason to say, hey, Jane, you know, I've always wanted to chat with you about whatever, or hey, Jane, I'm writing an article on this and that, and I would love to interview you on it. So you want to bring them down the funnel from knowing them a little bit to then having a technique to build some friendship. Sure. Uh, David, to express the importance of what you just mentioned on this referral network, uh, we actually, in LegalSoft, we created a position because uh, a lot of people see your recommendations, but they fail on execution of actually yeah. doing it because they go away and they get busy with running a practice and they forget about how valuable this is, that they can increase their practice by 40% with a very little cost. Mm -hmm. and much easier than going and running an ad campaign on Meta or Google and things like that. So we created a virtual staff, which I personally use it myself too, that mm -hmm. we give up my LinkedIn account. And this person all day long does a connection request through LinkedIn to every attorney in the state. And mm -hmm. I am building up like adding like eight, 900 attorneys a month to my network by just somebody really interested in just doing connection request, connection request. And the ones that respond back, then I get engaged and I start yeah. talking to them and make them a referral source. So we do it now officially for law firm, exactly what you're prescribing here to actually get it to be done instead of just understanding how important it is and then move on, not doing it. I mean, it's, I mean, it's great. And how many times have we heard lawyers say, oh yeah, I should be on LinkedIn. I should do something, but I don't have the time and so on. Right. You found a way to outsource the most labor intensive part of it. And then anything that comes down the funnel where someone is actually actively engaged, then that's brought to your attention. So it's a brilliant way to be able to leverage other people's time. Yes. So that's great. So, you know, one of the things is you've got your network, but how can you grow it? How can you deepen it? And there's a book out there called Giftology. And he has a phrase in it, and it's, you want to become a giverpreneur, be in the business of giving things. Because when you give things, people are attracted to that, and they feel like they want to reciprocate. And it's what friends do. And you want to go and try, try to develop friendships with the right high-value people. So I want to give you some techniques here on some of the ways you can be a giverpreneur. You know, are there ways you can help people achieve the goals that they want to achieve? Introduce them to people. Um, you know, as a lawyer, very often you have that ability to give them ideas and counsel them on ways to be able to do things better than they're doing it now, depending on your practice. So this is sort of the overarching statement of help other people succeed. You know, so many times you've got a great network. You meet people and there are folks in your network that they would want to meet. Some of the best business developers I know are, are just fantastic networkers, and they're always thinking about who in their network they could put together with each other. Also, you can help people with visibility. So if you have a referral source that you really want to nurture, maybe you go and put on a webinar with them, or you ask them if they want to co-author an article with you. I'm actually, I'm writing an article right now on uh, um, artificial intelligence and how it will impact client development. And I sent emails out to about 20 people who are prospects of mine 
to, to ask them if they wanted to contribute to this. And I got about five or six to respond. And they said, oh, thank you so much. And it was just a great way to A, remind them what I do for a living. Number two, to get great content for an article. And so it's just a great way to be able to give something of value because other people want to become more famous also. Maybe you can do a review or audit of whatever their policies and procedures are based upon your practice. And I've seen a lot of lawyers do this in a way it's inexpensive, it's just a half hour or an hour, but it gets your nose under the tent. You get to really look at their business and their life, and then you make recommendations. And that's kind of where you want to be in the network, talking to people about their issues and their needs from your legal perspective. Another thing that a lot of people do is to offer to do in-house presentations at clients. It's a great way if you know, let's say if you're in, you're a corporate lawyer and you know the CEO, then you can offer to do the talk and then you'll meet the entire C-suite. And then you've got a chance to audition in front of this whole group. It's just great ways to get out in front of your network. Another thing, you know, every once in a while you find a nuance, you find something that is more efficient and better in the way of practicing. And then if you have that kind of a client base, you can use that as a reason to reach out and say, you know, we've done this new, we have this new approach for doing X, Y, and Z. And I wanted to share it with you because I thought it might be more efficient for you. Again, you morph this for your own practice, but these are some techniques to think about how you can be giving. And then of course, no shortage of social time. Breakfast, lunches, dinners, cocktails. I know one is a senior associate at a firm, and she gets uh, work from banks and from bankers. And she has a network of about 30 or 40 bankers. And she says she goes out to happy hours about three to four times a week. And she has fun doing it. She has the personality for it. And she is building this network so that when she matures in her practice and these folks mature to when they're making the decisions of where to place it, She's now invested five or 10 years in nurturing the relationship. All right. So this is one of the big ones. And this gets overlooked because we all assume that we deliver good levels of service. But you see the word that I put here, which is wow. Because a lot, every lawyer, <laughs> literally every lawyer that I've coached, when I ask them, so what differentiates you and so on, they all give me some version of I deliver better service than other lawyers. And statistically, that's impossible. So there's a dysfunction in how we see the world. So I want to share with you what I call the five pillars of delivering wow levels of service. And you see in the top here, it says, you want to not go for satisfaction. We want to go way beyond that. We want to build a level of trust and client loyalty that blows away all other lawyers. This is typically a two-hour presentation in itself, but let me just give you the five pillars. Number one, invest the time to really know their business. Learn about their, their industry, what's going on in their business, go get Google alerts, and then find a way to bring up something when you're talking to them. It makes them go, wow, they really care. Another version, this is also another long topic, which is responsiveness. And you know, when I ask lawyers, what does responsiveness mean to you? It could be, well, get back within a half day, 24 hours, two hours. Look, whatever your standard is, it doesn't matter. It's what the client standard is. And there are some, some clients that say, if you don't get back to me in five minutes, I'm calling the other lawyer. And so you've got to understand what clients believe is a high level of responsiveness. You also want to try to do more than what other lawyers do, adding value. And, and it doesn't even have to be in the legal sense. I remember one lawyer, whenever he would fly to go visit a client, he would go to the bookstore in the airport. He'd find a book that he thought the client would like. And he would bring it to them saying, it was in the bookstore and this made me think of you. So now what does the client do? They probably take the book, either read it or put it up on the credenza. And it always reminds them of the lawyer. It's something that most lawyers don't do. We're so busy doing the work, we don't think about the human relationship side. Also being proactive. Uh, you're not only a lawyer, but you're a counselor. What can you counsel people on so that they don't get into trouble or the trouble will be less bad because you were able to give them good advice in advance. This is what people are dying for. And then finally, it's about managing the relationship. So it's when you first meet with a client, what are they, what, what's important to them? 
What experiences do they ever had with lawyers that they didn't like? You want to know that. What have lawyers done that they've loved? You want to know how you're going to be measured. Ask them about service. Ask them about responsiveness. Do you like me to be on WhatsApp or text or phone or mail? Everybody's different. So you know you have your typical intake questions, but these are more the client service questions. Then during the matter, check in. How are we doing? Is there anything we can do any differently? Because you never know. They may have different a view of how well you're doing. You want to know that early. And then at the end of the matter, check in. How did we do? Is there anything else we could have done any differently to be able to help you? And then the magic last question. Is there anything else we can do to help you? This is part of the communication in managing the relationship. All right. Now, this is one of the biggest areas that I find lawyers get uncomfortable with, which is I know the names of the people I want to meet, but how can I come up with a reason to reach out that doesn't feel like I'm a desperate person dying for work? So I'm going to give you some examples here. Here's one. Very simple. And in a way, this comes back to what Hamid said, which is the anniversary. It could be, you know, I was thinking about you. How are things going for you these days? And it could be based on what we did or some other thing that they brought up. It's just, this is what a friend would do. And we always talk about how we're trying to get a friendly relationship with our clients. Not too many people are going to say, oh, come on, you're calling me for work. If you have a genuine interest, this is the way you can do it, especially with certain people that you know would be comfortable with us. Also, you know, many of our clients are challenged by whatever your practice is these days. And I'm wondering, how is that impacting you? Again, for your high value referral sources, potential clients, former clients, great, great question to ask. Here's another one. You know, I'm wondering how your company is planning to handle and address the new regulations on, right? A variation of the second one. But, you know, in, if you're in a certain practice, regulations change all the time. Employment lawyers, estate planning lawyers. You know, I was wondering if this is a good time to review your, and again, whatever your practice is. And I know estate planning lawyers that put in, in their systems, a sort of like a two-year touch for certain clients where they've done all the documentation, but then in two years, they'll reach out, hey, wondering if anything in life has changed. Do you have any new grandkids, Bob? Whatever is appropriate because things change. Okay, and then if you have something like uh, Google Alerts set so that you're seeing something coming in about a client. Hey, I saw your company was in the news for whatever. You know, how's that impacting you? And that's a great question because it's you personally. You're caring about the person. You could also say, how's it impacting you and the company? Whatever. These are just starting questions for you. And then, of course, if you're a litigator and you have those services that will show when complaints are filed, you can go and ask a question like this. So these are some of the ways to be able to break through the ice when we sit there and we go, ah, I just don't know how to do it. I, I kind of call this, we tie ourselves up in knots, N-O-T-S, all the reasons why not to reach out to someone instead of doing what I call the 30 second rule, which is take 30 seconds, think about it and see if you can come up with a reason to reach out. Those who do their books of business, you know, it, it's clear. The old Wayne Gretzky hockey player uh, quote, which is, I missed 100% of the shots I don't take. We often don't even shoot to try to reach out to clients because we don't have a good reason. And these are some approaches for you. All right. At this point, um, I'm not exactly sure how the process works to ask questions. Maybe it would be in the chat or however that works. So if you want to put it in the chat, but while you're doing that, I'm just going to go on to the next piece and then we can answer the questions. First, what I want to offer is that I have these weekly tips that I send out. And the QR code there, if you put your phone up to it, or you can see underneath you could what the URL is. And it just gives you tips like you see on the left to constantly be reminding you of the things you could do to become a truly exceptional Rainmaker. So feel free, go click that link and, and be able to sign up. And then also, we had talked about in the preparation to this program that I've got this program called Lawyer Book Builder. It basically is my 30 years of training and coaching, well over 10,000 lawyers at over 225 law firms in the world. I've packed it into an online course. And so what I'm going to do is after this webinar is over, I'm going to see the attendee list 
I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to pick someone and I'm going to be offering one free course to someone who attended this today. All right. And then, Hamid, I know you uh, have your books here you want to talk uh, about. Sure. My first book was How to Scale Your Stupid Law Firm. And then <laughs> we came from technology. I found a lot of law firms are operating not very intelligently. And then pretty quickly, the AI came. So I scratched out the stupid. I said, now you got an AI firm to worry about. So this is where you should know what's the impact of the AI is going to be in every single practice area. Uh, and the practice tune-up was basically what I was doing when I was going into the firms and coaching and restructuring the firms for the scaling. So I basically put it all down on paper and made it into a, a, a book that people can get. So if they scan this, we'll be happy to send them the book or get them themselves. But the, the QR code, uh, if they contact us, we'll be happy to send the copy of the books to everybody who's uh, interested to see one. Okay, great. I'm going to stop sharing and then see if uh, anything's in the chat, which I do not see. So if anybody has any questions, happy to answer them. And of course, I'm sure, Hamid, I'm speaking for you here probably as well, is if anybody wants to reach out after this and reach out to us, we, of course, would be happy to answer any questions you have. Absolutely. Well, I think we're good. Hamid, thank you for inviting me on this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure as usual. You have a wealth of knowledge in this industry. I'm sure everybody will benefit from. And thanks for everybody who has stayed in this podcast with us. Okay. Thank you. Take care, Bye. everybody.